All right, so we move to Chapter 9, Business Income <clears throat> Deductions and Accounting Methods. All right, so recall that when you are in a business, even though you're an individual taxpayer, you are a sole proprietor and you must, unless you're a partnership and then you've got to file a different tax return, but if you are in business by yourself, even though you have employees, <clears throat> if you are the owner, you're going to file a Form 1040 and you're going to attach Schedule C include that with your 1040 so you're going to list your revenues from uh, services or sales of products or both you're going to list your expenses on there as well schedule c and then the difference between your uh, business income and business expenses is either a uh, net profit or a net loss and then you're going to transfer that amount over to line 12 of <clears throat> the 1040 now uh, again how do you determine business income well it's just like you do for individual income determination it's income from whatever source derived for the most part now you do get some exclusions just like individuals do for instance with municipal bond interest but uh, you gotta list all your income unless it's a, uh, specifically excluded now as far as these expense deductions are concerned again we talked about this before I believe in chapter 6 any expenses that you deduct from income must be directly connected to the business activity so for instance you can't be paying for groceries and expect to deduct those if those groceries are for personal benefit and so it's got it first of all it has to be related to the business activity and it has to be ordinary necessary and reasonable now here they say ordinary and, and necessary have meanings I don't know if these meanings help you but they say that ordinary an ordinary expense is an expense that's normal or appropriate for the business under the circumstances but the expense does not necessarily have to be typical or repetitive in nature and the example they use is legal fees unless you're getting sued a lot which is not usually the case usually uh, you're getting sued by another party once well very seldom but you know it could happen right if you're in business it could come from a customer it could come from a creditor uh, could come from a, a supplier could come from any uh, number of sources but anyway bottom line is <clears throat> for most businesses le paying legal fees is uh, something that doesn't happen very often but if you're in business it's uh, expected that you might be sued and if you are then it's certainly ordinary to pay 
and deduct a legal expense. As far as um, My phone's talking to me. That was weird. I didn't ask it to. Alright. The book says that an expense is necessary if it's helpful or conducive to the business activity. Now, it need not be essential or indispensable. And so... Um, the example they use is metric tools uh, for a mechanic. Now, here in the United States, does every mechanic need metric tools? Well, certainly if you're going to work on foreign cars, yeah, you're going to probably need those more than you would, uh, you know, regular half-inch uh, wrench or socket. Uh, probably isn't going to work. You're, you're probably going to have to use something in millimeters. <clears throat> but if you work on American cars, but maybe in the future you expect to work on foreign cars, then the purchase of socket wrenches in metric form would be something that's necessary because if you work on a foreign car in the future you're going to need it well what about reasonable it can't be extravagant now why in the world would a business owner pay more than what they should. Well, it's usually not a problem except when you've got, for instance, uh, family members involved. And we talked about this, I believe, as well. Um, when you when you're paying when you're employing family members uh, you might be tempted to pay them more than what's reasonable if you do and again I think I mentioned you know paying your your four 15 year old son or daughter to work in your business and paying them $45,000 a year and they're only working part time and mostly they're just sitting there answering the phone uh, that's not going to be reasonable that's going to look like you're you're trying to shift income to your uh, child who's in a uh, lower tax bracket and so you're you're only you're only going to be allowed to pay them whatever amount the IRS deems reasonable. So we have a an example here. Rick owns a business that employs his brother Ben. Ben is paid forty five thousand dollars per year by Rick's business. In comparison, other employees with his responsibilities, Ben's responsibility, are paid 30000 per year. What is Rick's business deduction for employing Ben? Well, obviously the answer is $30,000. What happens to the extra 15000 Well, here, since you have family members involved that additional 15 is going to be a gift from Rick to Ben and Rick may have to file a gift tax return now along with those requirements for expenses to be 
deductible. Congress has deemed certain other types of expenditures to be non-deductible as well. And so we have these uh, statutory limits on business expense deductions. The first of those relates to uh, expenditures that Congress considers to be against public policy. They don't want to encourage or even uh, have the appearance of encouraging certain types of expenditures occurring within a business. For instance, you don't, I mean, there's laws against uh, paying and receiving, as well as receiving bribes. So why would Congress want to allow uh, paying bribes as a, an expenditure, an allowable expenditure? And so for that reason, they don't allow deductions for fines and bribes, fines and penalties and bribes, and kickbacks. Now, what happens if you receive a bribe? Uh, the, the weird part is, if you receive a bribe or kickback, you've got to report that as income. Income from whatever source is derived. It doesn't say it has to be from a legal source. Um, even, even drug dealers are required to file a tax return on their uh, illegally gotten gains. And interestingly enough, even if you have uh, income from I illegal activity, you get to deduct the cost of the drugs in this case. So you would have a uh, cost of goods sold for the amount of the drugs. And any other uh, ordinary, necessary, and reasonable expense related to your drug dealing business. The problem, of, of course, in that kind of business, or in any other kind of business, is these people don't <laughs> uh, report any income. I once had a uh, client who was a bookie in the town of Sulphur Springs, Texas. And apparently he was being audited by the IRS. And of course he comes to my, into my office concerned about, you know, having to divulge the fact he's a bookie he obviously he didn't wasn't reporting his bookie income and i think his biggest concern was the fact that you know uh, sulfur springs probably has about 10 or 15,000 uh, people in it and he was concerned about the fact that several of his clients were high-profile individuals in the town. Doctors, lawyers, judges, you name it, business owners. Um, and if his client list was made public, it, it could be really bad for him. <laughs> really bad maybe who knows maybe even 
painful bad in, injurious to his health. <clears throat> so, but anyway, he's supposed to report all his income, including from his bookie business. The book talks about the fact that you cannot deduct political contributions or lobbying costs as well. We talked about this earlier, the fact that um, if you purchase an asset and the benefit you're going to receive from that asset uh, extends more than a year, <clears throat> you've got to capitalize that expenditure and you recover the cost of that asset through depreciation. Personal expenditures. You don't get to deduct personal expenses unless those expenses are expressly authorized by a provision in the law. And so, what's a personal expense? Your home, your house payment, your rent, your groceries, your car that you use for uh, commuting to work. You can't deduct those expenses. For the most part, clothing you can't deduct as well. It's a non-deductible personal expenditure. What about educational expenditures? Let me let me move this forward. See if they talk about this in more detail. Oh. Back to capital expenditures. So, question you have to ask yourself is, does the expenditure provide a, a future benefit beyond the current year? If so, you have to capitalize it rather than de deduct. So, here's an example of that. Being a cash uh, basis taxpayer makes the following payments on June 30th of this year. $10,000 for the next 10 months of utilities. Uh, $12,000 for insurance over the next um, 24 months. $9,600 for the next 8 months of interest on a business loan. Which amounts are deductible or what amounts are deductible this year? Well, he can deduct all the $10,000 because it doesn't exceed 12 months. Of the insurance, again, this happens in June, so he gets to, <clears throat> number one, the benefit exceeds 12 months, so in that year, uh, since he made this payment in June, he gets to deduct six months worth of insurance expense. So $500 times six months, $3,000. Um, an additional twist is that regardless of whether or not the benefit here... Um, You've got a business loan, and I think the key here is the business loan uh, extends beyond the 12-month period, so you're paying interest for uh, the next eight months, so you're going beyond the tax year. You're extending that into next year, interest expense into next year, so the prepayment of uh, interest on a loan 
uh, doesn't matter. So you could you could prepay for like next year and still get away with it. All right, so you don't get to deduct for purely personal expenses. What happens if there is an expense that has both a mixture of personal enjoyment as well as it has a, uh, a motive of earning a profit? because that does happen. So it kind of depends on what the uh, main motive is, primary motive. It's not an all or nothing thing here. So if the primary motive is business related then you get to deduct the business travel if you're away from from home overnight Let's see, they don't really do a very good job of this in this um, portion of the chapter. Let's break this down. Meals. Even if it's solely for business related activities you're you're you've got a, a prospective client or an existing client that you're having dinner with can the the question is can you deduct all of that expense and the answer is no well why does congress not allow that well congress doesn't allow it because everybody has to eat and so even though it's solely business related you don't get to deduct the whole expense of the meal you can deduct 50 percent of the meal if number one the amount must be reasonable under the circumstances the taxpayer, number two, the taxpayer must be present when the meal is furnished. Makes sense. And three, the meal must be directly associated with the active conduct of the taxpayer's business. And again, they have some examples there in example 9-6. In 
And so in that example, notice uh, Rick in the second scenario, he did not discuss business with the client either before, during, or after the meal. What amount of the expenditures can, can Rick deduct as a business expense? The answer is no, because uh, even though it may be uh, reasonable and certainly the taxpayers present, the meal's not directly associated with the active conduct of the, the taxpayer's business. So they got to talk business while they're eating, either before, during, or directly after. Well, what about... Uh, you know, many times when you're, uh, many times when you're conducting business, you have to go out of town overnight. So you get uh, travel and transportation expenses involved, and so transportation expenses includes the direct cost of transporting the taxpayer to and from uh, business sites. Note that commuting from the taxpayer's home to his office is not deductible. However, let's say the taxpayer goes to their office early in the morning from their home and then drives to other locations. Well, those costs once he leaves the office to those other locations are deductible as long as they are business related. So what can you deduct? Well, you can deduct the cost, the actual cost of operating the vehicle plus uh, depreciation based upon the, the vehicles tax basis and of course the the alternate is to deduct the standard mileage rate which would include the cost of gas as well as depreciation expense um, at a rate of uh, in 2018 54 and a half cents per mile <clears throat> All right, so that, you know, when you're using a car, that's in the book, that's what they're calling transportation expenses. Travel expenses might include some of that, but also includes uh, airline miles and other things so the distinction here is you are away from home overnight while you're traveling if you're away from home overnight while traveling besides the cost of transportation you get to deduct 50% of your meals. You get to deduct lodging and other incidental expenses. You get a taxi. You can deduct that expense. Now, what does it mean to be away from home overnight? Well, Again, it has to be, you've got to compare how far this taxpayer is traveling away from home. And the distance has to be of sufficient duration to require sleep or rest. So it... it it usually requires some overnight stay.
Well, what happens if they're you're not only there for business, but you you want to spend a few days sightseeing? So again, you've got a mixed motive by the taxpayer. Well, again, it depends on the primary purpose of the trip. If the primary purpose of the trip is business, the transportation costs are fully deductible. You go to Washington, D.C. for a conference, business conference. The business conference lasts three days. You're going to stay an additional two days to see the sites. Well, three out of those five days are business related since your primary purpose, a majority of your purpose for the trip is business related. You get to deduct the following. You get to deduct all of your transportation costs. You get to deduct meals for the three days of your business trip. You do not get to deduct, now that's 50% of the, the cost of the meals for three days. You do not get to deduct any of the meal expense for those two days you're there on personal business. You get to deduct your lodging for the three days there you're there on business. And you get to deduct incidental expenditures for those three days you're there on business, but not the two days. Well, what happens as far as individuals who don't keep track of their travel and transportation expenses and, and meals? Um, can they still deduct them? For the most part, no, because you've got to keep good records, and these records have to be what they call spontaneous or contemporaneous records, meaning you've got to document the purpose and the time and the amount at the time you incur the expense. I see so many um, individuals who are sole proprietors, you know, they do something, they get an idea and they start doing it, whatever that idea is, whether it be a product, a service, they do it well enough to support themselves in a business as a sole proprietor. They're so good at what they do and it takes up, consumes so much of their time that they don't do the little things, the little details, which are keeping good records. And so they get audited on their expenses and they don't have documentation. And so what do they try to do? Well, they try to make up the documentation. I had a gentleman who was a... Um, a traveling insurance agent selling life insurance traveled all around the state and so he got audited because you know he's showing pretty good amount of of gross income but 
you know, his taxable income just wasn't very much. So he's, you know, showing something like $150,000 of gross income and all these business-related expenses and his taxable income was only like, I don't know, twenty or $30,000. Well, that's going to raise red flags because... Uh, you know, kind of as as a standard gauge, uh, your ex business expenses shouldn't be more than fifty percent of your uh, gross income. Otherwise, you shouldn't be in business. It does happen, but I mean, for the most part, if you are good at what you do, your your business expenses are not going to be 80 or 90 percent of your gross income. You just can't make any money that way. You can't survive that way. At least, you know, for, for small business persons. So you got to keep good records. All right, so we have an example here. Ben paid the following to attend a business meeting in Chicago. Airfare, first class, $1,200. Must have been United or uh, American Airlines. Hotel, three nights, $750. Oh, well, that's pretty pricey, but it is Chicago. And meals for three days, $270. So averaging 90 a day. What amounts are deductible if Ben spent two days in meetings, primarily business? What amounts are deductible if Ben spent one day in a meeting, primary, primarily personal? All right, so two days, primarily business, because a majority of his time is spent on business. He gets to deduct 1200 airfare, um, 500 hotel, and $180 for meals. The rest is not deductible. Now, if two days, uh, what does he get? Well, no airfare. Um, one night of hotel and one night or one day of meals. Whoa. So, if you're going to go somewhere out of town and you want to deduct the costs, make sure that the majority of your time is spent on business related activities. All right. <clears throat> what if you're in business and you sell <clears throat> business assets? Well, you get, if it's a loss, in other words, what you realize it on it, the proceeds you receive from it, are less than the basis of the asset, you have a loss. That loss on business property is fully deductible. Unlike for individuals who are not in business. No, it has to be a business, a, a, a business property, personal or real.
Casualty losses, unlike individuals who are not in business, individuals who suffer a loss due to assets in the business that are stolen, damaged, or completely destroyed, may deduct casualty losses in the year the casualty occurs or in the year the theft of the asset is discovered. Well, what amount is allowable? as an expense. And so here the casualty loss is limited to the lesser of either the decline in value or its basis. And so, again, the distinction really boils down to whether it's uh, the asset's completely destroyed or stolen, or if it's partially destroyed. When the asset's completely destroyed or stolen, the business calculates the amount of the loss as though it sold the assets for the insurance proceeds, if any. And so the loss would be the amount of insurance proceeds minus the adjusted tax basis of the asset. <clears throat> now, if, it's, if the asset's only partially damaged, not completely destroyed, the amount of the loss is the amount of the insurance proceeds min minus the lesser of the asset's adjusted tax base, basis or the decline in value of the asset due to the casualty. And so they have an example there of 9 dash, in example 9 dash 12. Now this is an example of an asset that was completely destroyed. So this is not a partial, but you know, just follow the formula. It's not hard. All right, moving on to accounting periods. The, the accounting period you can use depends on what you are. Are you a corporation? And if so, are you an S Corp or a C Corp? Are you a partnership or are you an individual taxpayer? So, again, the type of business you are depends on the tax year that you can choose. And so there are three types of tax years. There is the, the calendar year taxpayer. Their tax year ends 1231 of a particular tax year. You can have a fiscal year and if you choose a fiscal year, it can be other than 1231. And so it would be the last day of the month other than December. You can also have something called a 52-53 week year. And so if you elect that 
your fiscal year would end on the last Saturday in July each year or ends on the Saturday closest to the end of July. Although it might be actually in, in August. And so for sole proprietors, <clears throat> your tax year is the same as the propri proprietor themselves, the individual taxpayer, and individual taxpayers must use a calendar year in end to report their business income. So for sole proprietors, 1231 is the only option. For flow through entities, that's going to be uh, S-Corps invariably uh, elect to be taxed as a partnership. That's the advantage of being an S-Corp. Um, partnerships, of, of course, uh, are taxed as partnerships, as flow-through entities. And um, many, many limited liability companies are taxed as partnerships as well. So they're flow through entities, and if you if you are a flow through entity being taxed as a partnership, you must adopt tax years or a tax year that's consistent with the owner's tax years. So we'll get into that at some point. Um, not sure what chapter that that is in, but it, it is in a later chapter. Uh, last but not least, C Corps are allowed to select any of those calendar year, fiscal year, or the 52 or 53 uh, week year end. And so for C-Corps and individuals, the choice made on, well, should say just C-Corps, you get to pick your uh, tax year by filing a tax return. Now, the one caveat is that uh, if you're going to pick a particular tax year, it's got to be consistent with your book accounting period as well. All right, we're going to take a break here and then I'm going to come back and talk about uh, accounting methods. <clears throat> 